morning. Welcome to Tuesdays with the Pilgrim as we continue our Christmas special, Sidney Martin's Christmas. Today we have chapter 3 and 4, so let's get to it. He had just one thing to do that day that had a little touch of business about it, and all the dignity of an appointment. That was to take a smooth and beautifully polished wooden top that he had made down to Mr. Chester Seymour's on Seymour Avenue and to be there at one o'clock precisely. There was to be a simple little Christmas tree shown off at that house at that hour. The tree was for the benefit of Mr. Seymour's half-dozen little nephews and nieces who were clustered around him, and the little lame boy who lived with them was to be counted in. This lame boy was a pet of Sidney's. He looked like a certain little boy at home who slept with Sidney when he was there, and whose company was sorely missed. The top had been made for him in spare moments, and since the thought came to Sidney, the moment had been so spare that he had walked around to Mr. Seymour's the night before to ask if the top came at nine o'clock the next morning, would it be in time for the tree? Then and there Mr. Seymour had rejoiced his heart by a promise if he should bring it precisely at one o'clock, it should be hung at once, and he should have a peep at the tree. This program was carried out, and the tree was heartily admired by Sidney. There was nothing on it for him, nobody had thought of that, but he had expected nothing, so as he would have said, he hadn't missed anything. "'Could you go home by way of Mr. Stewart's, my boy?' Mr. Seymour had said, as he, having enjoyed lame Nettie's delight over his top, was about to go. "'Could you as well go home by way of Mr. Stewart's and leave a note there for me?' Or will it take you too far out of your way? It is quite a distance round. Yes, sir, said Sidney promptly. No, sir, it's not too far. I'd like the walk. I haven't a single thing to do. This is a holiday, you know. Mr. Seymour had smiled and thanked him and given him the note and hoped he would have a merry Christmas and went back to his dining room and his turkey. There was not to be any turkey at Sidney's boarding house. Though they were poor, in the farmhouse twenty miles away, they raised turkeys, and always had one for Christmas. Sidney knew the smell, and whiffed it up like a breath of home, and he turned from Mr. Seymour's hall. Chapter 4 I Might As Well Go That Way Mr. Stewart lived exactly in the opposite direction from Sidney's boarding house, so how Mr. Seymour could have said, Go around that way home, I'm sure I don't know. Our boy Sidney was getting just a trifle tired of long walks, but they seemed to be exactly in his line on this Christmas holiday. So he trudged briskly on, trying not to think of home any more than he could help. His note delivered, he stood a moment in thought. Should he go home around Pikes Hill, or take a shortcut across it? I might as well go one way as another, he said aloud. What is the difference? I guess I'll take the hill. That will bring me home in time for my dinner. So up the steep hill he climbed, getting out of the way of half a dozen coasters as they rushed gaily down. One, though, didn't rush down. Instead, he pitched over on his back. Sidney was the only boy who was not halfway down the hill or just starting on that journey. And Sidney went at once to him. He was groaning a little and in trying to get up groaned some more and fell back. That nasty sled of mine, he exclaimed as Sidney bent over him. It has got a loose runner. I told Jimmy it would be the death of me. Help me up, can't you? I've hurt my foot, or broke it, or something. It twisted right under me. Where do you live, Sidney said, and succeeding in seating him on the sled, just as some of the riders came puffing up to see if it was anything more serious than a tumble. I live on Pine Street, and how am I ever to get there is more than I know. And he groaned as he hit one foot against the other. Can't some of your friends draw you there? Sidney said, looking at the boys standing around. He shook his head. They aren't my friends, he said. I never saw them before. They are from the upper village, and they have got to meet the sleigh they came with at two o'clock. They'll be likely to do it, won't they? This with a smile as the clock in the town chimed too, and every boy suddenly took to his heels. Sidney drew his breath. He was just tired of walks, and this was not so interesting a sprain as he had helped home earlier in the day, 
But of course, the boy couldn't be left sitting there, so he spoke quickly. I'll draw you home. Sit as steady as you can, and I won't jolt more than I can help. And away they went, down Pikes Hill and off toward Prime Street, a quarter of a mile away. You're a real good boy, said the sprained boy's mother, as he delivered her son safely to her hands. Tommy won't forget you in a hurry, I guess. And Sidney walked away, rubbing his hands and feeling that he would not be likely to forget Tommy. He was such a heavy fellow. Chapter 5 The Sum of It All Just as Sidney was eating a cold dinner an hour later, the proper time, the senior and junior partners of the corner store shook their heads as they looked at each other, both being very grave. It looks dark, said the younger man. It does, that's a fact, said the elder. But then I can't seem to believe that he took it. I have always thought of him to be the very soul of honesty. But how else can we explain it? And here both seemed to grow sadder. The end of it was that a summons came to Sidney before he had touched his doughnut. He took it in his hand and made all haste to the store, wondering much as he was ordered to the private office. There has been a sad work going on here today, Sidney, began the senior partner as soon as the door was closed. I left a twenty-dollar bill in my desk last night, and my partner saw it there this morning at nine o'clock. This afternoon at three it was not there. Now, you know you are the only clerk in town today. Sidney looked from one to the other for a moment in startled wonder, as if to ask what all that, however sad it was, could have to do with him. He then began to understand. He was a quick-witted boy, and a just one. He did not fall into a rage, as boys in stories do, for it occurred to him that these men had only known him for four months, and there couldn't seem to be anyone else who could have taken the money, so it seemed natural enough to suspect him. His voice, though very earnest, was not angry. It looks as bad as possible, Mr. Barnes, but I truly know nothing about it. That's easy to say, Mr. Barnes answered coldly, and thinking in a sensible brain that it was very strange if the boy was innocent, that he was not indignant. The question is, can you give an account of yourself between the hours of nine and three today? Where have you been, and what have you been about? Sidney's face gloomed over, and he sighed heavily. I have been wandering along, and going nowhere in particular, and doing nothing at all. For all I can prove to you, I may have spent the twenty-dollar bill twenty times, only I haven't done it. There was a listener to all this sitting quiet in his chair. This was the senior partner's son, a young lawyer. He was looking searchingly at the earnest-faced boy. Have you any idea where you were at nine o'clock, he asked suddenly. Yes, sir, I was standing at the window looking out and wondering what to do with myself. The town clock struck and I counted and thought what an awful long day there was. What then? I went right straight out, and walked up the street as far as Judge Porter's. What stopped you there? Why, the little Shemways that come to our Sunday school were out singing Christmas carols, just as they did in Germany, and they got afraid of Bose, the judge's dog. And I'm not afraid of him, so I stopped and took care of them until they were through. Go on, what did you do then? Do you know? Yes, sir, I went on across the town bridge, and from there I went to Dr. Eldridge's on Stone Street. What took you there? Why, as I was walking down by the pond, Fred Eldridge stood there with his sled and his sister. She was on the sled. She can't walk. She has a sprained ankle. And Eldred wanted to go to the skating race, so I took his sister home. Just so. That took considerable time, didn't it? Yes, sir, it was twenty minutes of twelve by the town clock when I came back. Then did you go to dinner? No, sir, we don't have dinner on Christmas until two o'clock. That's the way we keep the holiday. Sidney said this with a gleam of mischief in his handsome eyes. Having a clear conscience, he could not help seeing the funny side of things. Very well, tell me what came next. Next I had an errand for Mr. Seymour's. Oh, on Seymour Avenue? What took you there? and the keen eyes looked at him steadily. Why, I had a top that I made for lame Nettie, and I didn't get it done till today, and Mr. Seymour said I might come around at one o'clock exactly to have a peep at the tree. Did you have it? Yes, sir, and it looked fine. So this was one o'clock, 
Then you went home, I suppose. No, sir. Mr. Seymour asked me to take a note to Mr. Stewart's at the corner just below Pike's Hill, and I went straight there. After that, I hope you had a chance to go home. Uh, no, sir, said Sidney, beginning to be amazed at his own story. I went up Pike's Hill to go across lots, and a boy had just tumbled over. They were riding down the hill like mad, and he sprained his foot. So I helped him up and drew him home. And who was he? His name is Smith, Tommy Smith. He lives on Prime Street, below the old market. Were you the only boy there was to do it for him? Yes, sir. The other fellows were strangers to him. So was I, for that matter. But they had come from the upper village for a sleigh ride, and they were to be at some point downtown at two o'clock to go back. They were late, too. The clock struck while we were getting Tommy Smith on the sled, and the fellows all ran like tops. And from Tommy Smith's, I earnestly hope you went home. I did, sir, said Sidney, with his face in a broad smile. The young lawyer turned to the two men, who had listened in breathless attention. I'll take the case, he said with pleasure. It is the most complete alibi I have heard this many a day, and the young man has been practicing all day on the Christmas carols that he began this morning with peace on earth, good will to men. There has certainly been much good will put into this day. It is a complete chain, the senior partner said heartily. My boy, I will go to every one of these parties whose names you have given, and if their statements agree with yours, it will settle a question of the bill. Whoever has it, it can't have been you. And they will agree, of course, said Sidney heartily, because it is so, and what else can they say? There is no need of going to them, said the junior partner. It is all right. And Sidney, as he went back to his boarding house, went thoughtfully over the day, and was much struck with the fact that something at every turn had marked the time for him. It did make a difference which way I went, and what I did after all, he said gratefully. And that's the end of the story. So sometimes doing good deeds comes back to be a good deed to yourself. And uh, as we saw in this case with Sidney Martin's day, providing an alibi to prove he didn't take the $20 bill. I hope you've enjoyed this little Christmas story. It's uh, kind of a fun one from the 1800s. The author's name, I can't remember her full name, but she wrote under the pen name Pansy and wrote quite a few short stories. I hope you've enjoyed, and we'll see you next week for Tuesdays with the Pilgrim. Not quite sure what we're going to do yet. Come and tune in, and you'll be just as surprised as I am when we find out what we're doing. Until then, take care, stay safe, and God bless.